Hello, welcome to this time of worship online. My name is Jason Stanton. I serve as senior pastor here at First Lutheran in Onalaska, and it is my joy to lead you in this time of worship. We get to hear a reading from Mark, uh, hear a message, good music to sing. Uh, it's, it's a good way to uh, leave whatever the world is giving you uh, this week and, and be reminded of, of God's mercy. Uh, couple words of announcement, especially for those who are participants and members at First Lutheran. Uh, next week, depending on when you're watching this, I should say September 8th. September 8th, which is a Wednesday, uh, we will be worshiping in person again in the sanctuary at 615. Uh, we will be masked. That is the precaution we're taking right now in the midst of the Delta variant. And so uh, Wednesday the 8th will be in person. On the 12th, uh, that's a Sunday. That's our first fest Sunday at 9.30. One worship service outside as weather permits. And then after worship from 10.30 to 11, that's a time that if you haven't had a chance to register for Sunday school yet, or even if you have, either way, you can register if you haven't already. But either way, you can meet your Sunday school teacher, see where the Sunday school rooms are. Again, uh, that is, Sunday school is happening, as is confirmation and everything else, but masked. Uh, the 15th of September will be the first week of small groups for confirmation. And the 17th, 18th, and 19th of September are our play days at Sugar Creek. It is not too late uh, to register for a place to stay at Sugar Creek or at least come for the day on Saturday or at least for worship on that Sunday morning at Sugar Creek. So lots happening in September as we not only launch into a new school year, as I know it is for many, uh, if you're watching this today on September 1st, uh, as we premiere this worship service. It's the first day of school for, the, for, for most kids in our area. So uh, congratulations to everybody who's made that uh, a reality. And so as we come into this time of worship, I invite you to join me in singing uh, a pretty familiar song about how we can be God's people in the world. We are reminded that we are equipped to, in Christ, grow not only ourselves closer to God, but as a, a group, as a, a family of faith. And so, believing that we are called to grow, we are reminded of our growth through confession and receiving God's forgiveness. And so, I'll offer words of confession and forgiveness now. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there's enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. 
we turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there's always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life. You're shown God's mercy, you're forgiven, and you are loved into life abundant. Amen. God, our strength, without you, we are weak and wayward creatures. Protect us from all dangers that attack us from the outside and cleanse us from all evil that arises from within ourselves, that we may be preserved through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our text for today is from the Gospel of Mark, the seventh chapter, little bits and pieces, verses 1 to 8, 14 to 15, and then 21 to 23. Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who'd come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders, and they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrine." You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There's nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that all evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. This is not a text, by the way, this is not what my sermon's about, but this is not a text that's slamming the washing of hands. That's not what Jesus is concerned about here. It's about tradition, what is true, what is real, what is evil, what is not. And one way to think about the, this text is thinking about whether the world happens to you or whether you were gifted to happen to the world. The Gospel of Mark spends a lot of words on that question whether things happen to us or we are here to happen to the world. If Mark had been interested in simply telling the biography of Jesus, like if Mark had just set out to write a history, well, then he wouldn't have written a gospel. A gospel has its own agenda. Mark would have told us a lot more about Jesus if it was just to be a biography of Jesus. Mark says nothing about Jesus' birth, his adolescence, or even the young adulthood of Jesus, just nothing. Mary, Jesus' mother, is mentioned one time. Joseph, not at all. Lots of scholars spend a lot of time on the historical Jesus. Like, what exactly did Jesus say? What exactly did Jesus do? Where did Jesus say it? When did it happen? They want all the, the facts about Jesus. But Mark, that's just not what Mark is concerned with. Mark isn't about trivial facts for us to memorize. Mark is simply a gospel. And gospel means good news. That's what Mark set out to do, write a a good news. Mark is way more than facts. It's good news, and at its core, it leads all people to the crucified Christ who's found 
in the end, to be absent from his own tomb. Death, the world's worst piece of bad news, tried to happen to Jesus, but instead Jesus happens to death and breaks death's power. In bringing us to this most amazing ending, which is actually a whole new beginning, Mark uses sayings of Jesus, parables of Jesus, healing stories where Jesus heals all kinds of different people, teachings of Jesus, all to help us digest and make sense of and process the so what. So Jesus overcame death. So what? How does that affect me? How does that affect the world? So Mark aims high and makes extraordinary claims as to how the resurrection transforms individuals like you and me, and therefore the whole world. That's really the whole point of the gospel, to proclaim the good news that because of Jesus, the world changed. Individuals can, unlike ever before, live out from worldly empires and live instead in the empire of God. Capitalize the E and, of course, the G, empire of God. Most of the people who first heard Mark's gospel were living under the Roman Empire. There's a, a faraway emperor, a regional governor, and each had a military leader. Imagine being ruled by someone who speaks a different language, grew up with different values and customs, and was working in your city for the benefit of some faraway place. And there was nothing you could do about it. You had no power. That's what worldly empires look like. A few powerful lord themselves over the many powerless. But every Roman, no matter how powerful, at some point died, of course. And so the resurrection exposes who has true power. Jesus is the true power. And His sayings, His parables, His healings, His teachings, they all explain what true power means in contrast to the fake power, that Roman empire. What does true power look like in the empire of God? In a worldly empire, it looks like power over people. But in the empire of God, it looks like power over demons. We may not talk about demons in the same way as Mark did, but those of us who have known addiction, whether in ourselves or someone else, or those of us who have known depression or shame or envy, those feelings and actions we just can't escape, those are demons that some would say we have no power over. Jesus shows that in the empire of God, we have power over demons. We have power over illness in the empire of God. Healings and wholeness happen, not, not every time to everyone, but Jesus has mysteriously at some times, in some places, the power to heal. But perhaps the most difficult thing about Mark's explanation of power in the empire of God is how it is wielded through fishermen, not Pharisees. Power is used when sowing seeds, not reaping a harvest. Children enter the powerful places, the presence of God, not the rich men. The throne of Christ's power is not some gilded hall, but on the cross. Human empires would label the disciples low-class, blue-collar fishermen. They would label the children innocent, but also ignorant. I mean, really, how could a child have any power? Human empires label people and expect actions that appropriately follow those labels. King, subject. Each of you need to act like your role, your label. Master, slave. Play your role. Social scientists have used words like 
bourgeois or proletariat. In India, there are three castes, or actually even more than that, but there's the Brahmin to the untouchables. And again, be your label, play your role. More commonly, around here, we label people according to how wealthy they are. Lower, middle, upper class. Or we get more crass than that, don't we? Labels we put on people, white trash, rich, redneck, urban, rural. Most of us uh, at First Lutheran are labeled suburban. By labeling people, the world is able to put people in their place. The world then happens to you according to your label. If you're an untouchable in India, you're not going to live out from that label. Slaves, and there's still plenty of slaves in the world, they don't earn their way out. Suburban people are not allowed to settle for anything but the best, even if it makes them so busy they can't physically or mentally cope anymore. Living with a label limits who you can be and opens a channel for the world to happen to you. But in the empire of God, those fishermen aren't low class, blue collar. They're called and equipped to simply be disciples. Mary Magdalene and Mary, mother of James, they're not just women. That was their label of limitation. But they were called and equipped to be the first witnesses to a whole new world. Mark is full of labeled people, sinners, a paralytic, a blind man, a boy, a deaf man, a man with a demon, a poor widow. I say all these labels, and for many of us, we know their stories, but we don't know their names. We know their labels. And those labels were meant to limit them. And in human empires, they are limited. But in the empire of God, the blind man at Bethsaida is the first to see who Jesus really is. The widow who gives so little is the one who is truly generous. The demonized, the ill, the sinners, they're the ones who Jesus calls and equips to wield power in the empire of God. Power that comes from repentance and faith, not money, not influence, not treachery, not ruthlessness. Does the world happen to you? by limiting you successfully with labels, or do you happen to the world knowing and remembering that you're called, you're equipped by God to wield true power, power to forgive, power to be generous, power to love, power to include? This is what Jesus is getting at in this gospel text for today. The Pharisees are caught up in wondering whether it's okay to eat with defiled hands not having followed the traditions of the elders. Ah, another source of worldly power, following tradition. And Jesus says, those Pharisees, yeah, they honor him with their lips, but not their hearts. He says, there's nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. There is no label that can be put on you that must defile you. In fact, there's no event in your life that can happen to you and damn you. In the empire of God, it's not about what happens to you. You are not defined by your birth order or by your last name or by a diagni diagnosis that's out of your control. You're not defiled by your lot in life. There's nothing outside of you that by going in, or going on can defile you, but the things that come out are what defile. You're defined by your use or misuse of the gifts God gives you. In the empire of God, you're not limited by any label. You are called and equipped to be a child of God no matter who you are, who can then offer their self and all that they are to this empire, this kingdom of God. It can be so easy to stay stuck in our limiting labels. Well, I'm old. You know, what can I do? I'll just waste away now. Do you remember when John Glenn went back into space at age 77? 
that old label didn't stick on him. He kept using his gifts. Beethoven started losing his hearing in the middle of his life. Did the label of death stop him from making music? The world tries to convince us that the power of one is nothing, really. What's one vote among millions? Or my one car isn't going to change global warming? Or what can one person do, really? One is a label hard to live out from. But in the empire of God, each one of us is known, loved, called, and equipped to offer all the one we have. Putting our ones together, we become the church. The church carries its own labels from the world. We could, as a church, just shrug our shoulders and be like, well, that's who everybody thinks we are. Or we could go be the church in the grace-filled ways we know church can be. You have labels. The world labels us. Maybe you're a victim, or maybe you're a widow, or maybe you're divorced, or maybe you are labeled with cancer or depression or some other diagnosis. The good news from Mark this day is that none of our labels, none of our challenges defile us. We are free to live out from the, the world and all its limitations so that we could offer our best gifts in the name of Jesus. Thanks be to God. Amen. Made children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God, as we pray for your church this day, we think of all the ways that we are equipped to name your grace in the midst of all brokenness. God, be with us as we bravely offer our gifts, despite our labels, into the relationships we have, into the institutions we serve, into all the parts of our lives that need our bold words of love, reconciliation, and wholeness. And hear us as we pray for those people and places we know are in need. We think of the, the nation of Haiti and all who try to rebuild and recover there, for all who are uh, enduring wildfires in our own nation, for those recovering from Hurricane Ida. God, we pray for all in Afghanistan, no matter of what nation they are. We pray for those individuals we know who are in need. We name Tara and Lori and Todd. And God, we give thanks. We give thanks for a first day of school. As challenging as it remains, we give thanks for all the efforts that school administrators and teachers and all the support staff and bus drivers and parents and kids, all the efforts that our communities are making for school to happen, continue to provide the courage that all of us need to not only uh, make school happen, but to make it happen in a way that uh, is helpful to all. God, hear our prayers of gratitude as we share them with you. And God, finally, be with our, our own congregation here at First Lutheran as we continue to, to seek, uh, as we call a third rostered leader onto our staff, and as we look forward to the installation of uh, our new bishop, Bishop Felix. 
be with all the efforts of our church this month especially as we uh, relaunch many ministries that have uh, not happened for, for a long time. And so be with all of our confirmation uh, ministry leaders and Sunday school and all the other uh, ministries that we intend uh, to do together. For these and all those other prayers that we share with you, we offer them all in the name of Jesus, our risen Savior. Amen. And now receive a word of blessing. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace and remember always that you are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God.